You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. ESO, seven years of keeping it really geeky. Hey, what are you trying to do? You ruined my record, man. I just bought it. Hey, you guys! How exciting. (laughs) Spoilers. It's 106 miles to Chicago. We got a full tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes. It's dark, and we're wearing sunglasses. Hit it. Have fun storming the castle. Think it'll work? It would take a miracle. Goodbye. The Earth Station One podcast. It's time to let your inner geek out to play. You can find them at www.earthstationone.com or up on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or wherever fine podcasts are found. Peace, and we're done. Hello and welcome again to the Monster Sci-Fi Show Podcast. I am your host, The Monster, back to give you a review of Seth MacFarlane's The Orville. So I will be talking about at least the first three episodes that I got to watch. So let me give some background information. Uh, As far as the cast, we have Seth MacFarlane playing Ed Mercer. We have his wife, slash ex-wife, really, more ex-wife, Adrian Pilecki, who, if you know her from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., she was on for a season, as well as she was Wonder Woman that David E. Kelly did the pilot a couple of years back that was never picked up, but I thought she was fantastic in. Then we have Ed's crew, which is going to be the helmsman, uh, Gordon, played by Scott Grimes. The Navigator by John Lamar. I'm sorry, John Lamar is the Navigator, played by Jay Lee. Uh, we have the physician, Dr. Finn Penny Johnson Gerald, who, if you remember her from Deep Space Nine, she was Cassidy Yates, which I had, again, big crush on her. Again, I have big crushes on lots of women, so it doesn't make a difference who they are. They just have to be women. Uh, then we have Bordis played by Peter Macon. Alara Catan, who is the, I guess, the security, is Halston Sage, who, really, second episode, I started to have feelings for (laughs) for Catan. And then we have Isaac, played by Mark Jackson. So that basically rounds out the cast for the Orville. Now, as I talked about earlier... This is Seth MacFarlane's project. And if you know him from Family Guy and American Dad and, of course, Cosmos that he redid with Neil deGrasse Tyson, it's no wonder that Fox says, sure, go ahead, go ahead and do this. And honestly, I'm okay with the mindset of I like what Seth MacFarlane does with his humor. And I know what he can do with sci-fi-ish, even though it's more science-based projects, like with Cosmos. But he does love science fiction. And he does like Star Trek. He was on the last season of Enterprise in a couple of episodes. So I'm like, okay, I'm willing to give this a shot. This is what got me thinking about the last of my thought, oh, this might be really good. And that was 8 Million Ways to Die. Seth MacFarlane, I believe, directed, starred, and wrote this movie. And I thought, well, if he does what he does on American Dad and Family Guy, it could be this generation's blazing saddles. It could be that forward thinking with its humor, its sharp wittiness, but when you watch this movie, it doesn't come through at all. It's a dud, in my opinion. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that 
Seth is not really that interesting as an actor, at least on screen. He's great with voices. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. But there was something about that movie that just didn't work with me. Move on to the Orville, and I'm thinking, great, we finally get the Galaxy Quest movie that we have now, but now as a series. After watching the first episode, I'm just... <sighs> it's not hitting any any marks with me whatsoever. And I think the problem also lied is the fact in the first episode called Old Wounds, in which we get the the crew together, we have the first officer having to be his ex-wife, fine. All the jokes that I saw in the trailers leading up to the series are all basically there. The whole thing with Bordas, he only, you know, urinates once a year. Whereas... At Mercer throws in a line, I'm up two or three nights and, uh, times a night. I didn't think it was funny back when I saw the trailer, and it's certainly, certainly not funny when I see it again. Alright. Then we get Isaac. So Isaac was one of those people that was barely mentioned or barely seen in, in the trailers, and we finally get his introduction. And how his race is kind of superior to all that, all others, and bordering on a point of being racist. And I'm like, oh, could this be it? That we get that kind of robot that is talking talking down to the rest of the crew? No, we don't even get that. So what, for the love of me, <laughs> am I watching a series? that is trying to be part science fiction and part comedy and yet it's failing on both parts miserably I had to ask a co-worker one, uh, this past week when you're watching a new series how long do you give it before you say nah, I'm done when does it grab you or does not grab you at what point do you make that decision his decision was after the first viewing of the first episode. If it doesn't, it's done. Well, luckily for me, I watch way too much crap. And I watch the crap throughout the whole crapness, hoping that the crap will get better. Like Iron Fist. That Iron Fist, man. It didn't get any better except for the Defenders, which I was happy for. They see Danny Rand kind of be a little bit more likable and usable. But that was after, what, eight episodes? And then we get the Defenders? So that's a lot of time, a lot of hours to get there. So, uh, you know... I, I'm not much of a quitter when it comes to things. Hell, I've watched Bird of Prey, and I even bought the damn DVD series. And it was only, I think, 13 episodes, and that's with Dina Meyer and Mia Sarah. I only watched this so I can see, finally, the Dina Meyer as Batgirl and not as Oracle, because I was infatuated with Dina Meyer. So I was ecstatic when I finally see... Batgirl, even though that was small screen, and the series was god awful. Like the Huntress is the love child between Catwoman and Batman, and she has superhero powers that doesn't work in whatever. It doesn't make sense. But I watched it because of Dina Meyer and Batgirl, so I stuck it through and I got to see her in that episode. I'm like. Okay, at least I got to see that one moment and made it all worthwhile. The second episode, when we have um, command performance, Katan basically is in charge, and I'm really struggling as to... Really, we're going to have that be the A story, and the B story is that Mercer and his first officer 
are captured and placed in a zoo. Bordas, who is male, his companion is also male, the whole race is male, or basically expecting their first child and he has to basically sit on the egg to give birth to it. So as Katan is in charge and the ship is really under power under attack, you know, she's running off command asking Bordas to come back and it's like I can't leave my egg for whatever reason. And the joke there was that you see the backside of Bordas sitting sitting on his egg. It wasn't really haha funny. I get it that he's sitting on an egg. It didn't it didn't work well enough to dictate a whole hour of her trying to find her moment to become more than what she thought she could be. I thought it took way too long to get to that point. And she relied on the doctor to help her get through those rough patches. But honestly, I thought, if this is the tone of the show, you could have done this in a half hour and called it a day. It would have been great, but it just went on way too long. Now, having said that, what's the bonus out of all that? Katan. I've gone to be more appreciative of makeup. You got to see her ears, her 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 ridges on her face. They're beautiful. They're attractive. So that alone for me, I mean, that's what I got out of it. That's what kept me going through the episode is just watching Katan. And she's very cute. She's very adorable. But that was it. It was a very unmemorable show at this point. Two episodes in, and I'm just like, no, this is not good sci-fi. This is not good comedy. So, I'm plowing through this, and I'm going to say, all right, episode three. By this time, if it doesn't click, I really have to consider cutting my losses. The other storyline is that Bordas now has the child, and it turns out to be a girl at the end of episode two. So, that storyline continues. And then all of a sudden, we get quality science fiction story. Gender reassignment for a female child for an all-male race. Holy crap. You could have not have prepared me for this episode. I was enthralled by this. This is what I would like to have as a good science fiction story. And we finally got it from the Orville. The only problem here is the whole comedy aspect. It is so out of place with such a great story on a great issue. It's just hacked on there for shock value. It does nothing to push the story further. It doesn't enhance the story. It really distracts you from being in that story. So, putting all that aside, it is finally, to me, a great show for me to say, I'm going to give this whole season a pass. We shall see what happens at the end. But because of that one episode... I want to see where else they're going to go with this. Sure, it is like Star Trek. And I expect it to be like Star Trek, in which they can talk about things like that and add humor that is appropriate. And it adds another layer to that story. And I'm hoping that it does evolve over time, because 
my wife and I watched this last episode, and it's amazing. We were really into it. But, my God, your humor. And I think here, again, going back to the 8 million ways to die. Seth is in it. And I believe Seth wrote this. And I think this is the problem. Sometimes, like Gene Roddenberry, the great bird of the galaxy, you have a great idea. You may have a couple of even good story ideas. But sometimes, because you're the creator, you get in your own way of letting other people make that even better. I think American Dad, Family Guy, those shows work when Star- Seth does star in it and does his voices and all that, when other people put in their their points, their touches. And I think that's what's missing. Because if it's all on Seth, it's not there. But if Seth is writing It's a Girl and comes up with that idea about the gender reassignment issue, you have something there. You just need to find that balance between the sci-fi element and the humor in order for that to make it work. So, by no means am I giving up on watching the Orville. I'm really happy with what I saw. It gave me hope. It gave me promise of a future that I can think about watching it after I finish watching Gotham. In all fairness, the fourth season episode of Gotham. But unbelievably fantastic. So, if you have that as a lead-in, and you have the Orville, Thursday night, I'm there all the way. Unfortunately, with my schedule, I have to watch it the next day, but still, I think it was a good pairing, and I really am looking forward to seeing what this series can do. We've been needing something along the ways of a good sci-fi parody that works well. But sometimes when you try to do a drama and combine it with something else, it doesn't necessarily work. Like Cop Rock. (laughs) If you remember, that was also, I think, a David E. Kelly series that he tried to do um, a, a cop drama, but with music. And the idea was interesting, and I think the first episode or two were, okay, you're okay, let's see what you can do. But to come up with music every week for a different episode, I think that was, it's, it's Achilles' heel. The humor is going to be its Achilles' heel for the Orville. I have no doubt that Seth can do a better job in the future. I just think that there were some rough patches at the beginning. So I'm glad that I gave this a third chance (laughs) that normally I would have just said, "Eh, forget it. I'll watch after your season is completed and maybe if you get renewed. But no, I will actually watch this with everything else that I'm watching. Um, That's a lot, considering, like, for example, The Walking Dead. I'm on episode 4 of the last season. I'm on the Game of Thrones, I think, episode 3 of season 6. That's how back up I'm behind. But I'm willing to watch the Orville first over those episodes or those shows. So that, again, says a lot about me. So, I'm not exactly giving it a, a raving review here. I think you have to give it a chance. You have to give it at least to the third episode if you have not seen this. So, if by then, if it doesn't hit you all the right ways or find something that's compelling for you, then, you know what? Come back to it. If it's around, it's around. If it's not, it's not. We have way too many other things to worry about and to watch. Again, we are living in this great golden age period of watching internet stories, 
cable stories, network stories. I mean, it, it's just an, an onslaught of so many great stories coming our way. And we just don't have time to sit through a lot of crappy ones. So we'll see what happens. I'm sure I'll talk about this after the season is over and give my review overall. We'll see how it goes from there. But for right now, I'd say it's it's a watch. Not a must watch, but you, you should watch this. Like me, I'm hoping for the best. So, all right. So there you have it. That's my review of the Orville. So don't forget to email me at monster sci-fi show at gmail.com. You can follow me on the various social networks. So again, thank you for listening to me and to the Monster Sci-Fi Show podcast. It's sci-fi from a certain point of view. Good night. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Classic, current, and beyond. Be part of the crew at esonetwork.com.